If you're like me, you have a mixed relationship with study Bibles. Once in a while, they can give you a jolt of amazing insight or new understanding, but many times you find the notes redundant, useless, painfully obvious, filler fluff, or just simply irrelevant. Our tendency as readers is to ignore these problems and assume that the quote-unquote professionals know what they're doing but not Dr. Harriet Hill. Today, we're going to dive into her careful analysis of some major study Bibles and see how they can improve. Spoiler, it'll make you laugh and cry. There's a lot to learn and tons of room for improvement in the study Bible world. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. Let's start by introducing the author and guest in this episode, Dr. Harriet Hill. Today, we're going to be walking through her article entitled Relevant Study Bibles, but she's written a lot of other good books and articles. Here are a few, a textbook on Bible translation basics, another called Translating the Bible into Action, but my favorite is The Bible at Cultural Crossroads from Translation to communication. I'll link it in the description. Go get it. This book is easily one of the top five best books I've read on Bible translation, and I highly recommend it. Dr. Hill holds a PhD from Fuller Seminary in Intercultural Studies, and she served with Wycliffe and SIL for 33 years in Bible translation and scripture engagement before joining the American Bible Society. She lives in Philadelphia with her husband, Ralph, and has three married adult children and five grandchildren. She's also an artist. Her main experience has been with a people group in Ivory Coast. Dr. Hill kindly agreed to record herself reading some of the salient parts of her article so that you don't have to hear me the whole time. So as we walk through the article, her voice will pop in here and there. Now, because this article is titled Relevant Study Bibles, we need to begin by reminding ourselves what relevance theory is. Back in 1992, a guy named Ernst August Gut published a book called Relevance Theory, A Guide to Successful Communication in Translation. It's a short little book published by SIL. It's only 79 pages. And in it, he talks about the nature of communication and applying the principle of relevance theory to translation. And one of the basic principles of this is that people don't say what they mean. And this may sound shocking, but for example, if I say it's four o'clock, the utterance is clear, the time is four o'clock, but you wouldn't be satisfied that you had understood what I meant until you knew why I said it. Context is king. And so this is where the whole idea of a cognitive environment comes into play. See, we all have these little things floating around in our heads that provide a contextual framework by which we can make interpretations. All sorts of things contribute to your cognitive environment, especially your culture. And since we are so far removed from the culture and time and language of the Bible, there's a lot of our cognitive environment that really doesn't map onto what's being said in the Bible. So back to our example, if you say it's four o'clock, it might mean it's time for tea in one context. In another context, it might mean that we're late for a flight. Or it might mean that it's time to start a meeting. Depending on the context, the same exact words could mean opposite things. So that same phrase, it's four o'clock, could mean let's take a break or let's start working. Opposite things. So it's important to understand that hearers supply context depending on their cognitive environment. Let's take another example that Dr. Hill talks about. A mother says to her daughter, do you like your new teacher? And the daughter replies, He comes to school on a big motorcycle. Now, despite the lack of a direct answer, the mother understands that the daughter likes the new teacher. How does this happen? Well, speakers guess what their hearers know and say just enough to stimulate certain things they think their audience knows, so that between what is said and what they know, hearers understand the speaker's meaning. So here's how it works in our mind. 
we search for the speaker's meaning. So it starts worrying. We start working. And our minds simultaneously adjust our hypotheses about the text meaning, the context, and the interpretation until we find a combination that makes sense to us. And our minds are trying to do this as efficiently as possible. And when we're finally satisfied that we've understood the speaker's meaning, it may not be their meaning, but it's going to, whatever works, whatever clicks with our cognitive environment, once we have that, we stop processing. Now, as in the example with the mother and daughter, some of the contextual information we use in our search for meaning is information that's not represented in what's said at all. We also use contextual information to fill out the text so that it's fully specified. That is, details of specific times and places and people and concepts are spelled out. For example, the mother has to determine the referent of he when the daughter replies. He comes to school on a motorcycle. Which school is being referred to as well? You know, he comes to school. Which school? Well, she she has to fill all that in. And then finally, of course, she has to fill in the fact that her daughter likes big motorcycles, and so she likes her new teacher because of that. So our minds are constantly filling in ellipses and deciding the intended senses of any ambiguous words. This comprehension procedure our minds use can be summarized as follows. First, take the path of least effort. Second, search for meaning until we get enough cognitive effects to satisfy our expectations. And third, assume we've arrived at the intended meaning and stop processing. Communication has to be relevant enough for us to continue the effort of processing, and this depends on at least two things. First, the cognitive effects we experienced must be worth the effort it takes to process the communication. Speakers don't ask their audiences to process information unnecessarily. So hearers look for an interpretation that accounts for the effort they have been asked to make. For example, if someone says, be here at 2 o'clock exactly, we expect more meaning than if they had said, be here at 2 o'clock. Secondly, the cognitive effects we experience must satisfy our expectations of relevance. This varies for different communication events. We may have a very low expectation of relevance for a greeting but a very high expectation of relevance for a lecture. We feel we've understood a speaker when we experience enough cognitive effects to satisfy our expectation, and then we stop processing. So you can see where Dr. Hill is going with all this. Study Bibles should be filling in all of these gaps, filling in the cognitive environment that we lack so that we can make sense as quickly and efficiently as possible of the biblical text over this huge chasm that's between us and the ancient Near East. You can actually experience this very vividly if you go back and watch like The Tonight Show from 30 years ago or something. The whole cognitive environment that you need to make sense of the jokes and the references and the names that they drop in the pop culture of the time Unless you lived through that time and have an extremely good memory, it's all going to be totally lost on you. And let's assume that's even within your own culture, not some other culture. But when we read the Bible, we need even more help because it is another culture and it's an ancient one. So Dr. Hill provides us with a test verse or passage from which to judge a bunch of study Bibles, and see how well they do with providing the necessary context so that we can actually make good sense of what's being said. So here it is in the NIV, Luke 10, 13 through 14. The words of Jesus, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. So what does the audience need to know to understand what's going on here? Luke 10 tells the story of Jesus sending 70 disciples on a mission, right? He explains how they should act when they are well-received and when they are rejected. 
And then he speaks to the disciples as if he were speaking to the people of Bethsaida and Chorazin, perhaps because he's remembering when he preached in those towns. He laments the judgment they will face and then speaks similarly of Capernaum. Then he ends by saying, whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Why is Jesus saying this to his disciples? The point stressed here is that to reject the messenger is to reject the one who sent him, and in turn, to reject God who sent Jesus. Jesus is authorizing them to act in his name as agents of the kingdom of God. So, why is Luke writing this to his audience? Would they also need to know that they were agents of the kingdom of God and that some would accept their message and others reject it to their great peril? Let's listen to the passage one more time from the Good News Bible. So, a really, really dynamic translation. Here we go. How terrible it will be for you, Chorazin. How terrible for you too, Bethsaida. If the miracles which were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, the people there would have long ago sat down, put on sackcloth, and sprinkled ashes on themselves to show that they had turned from their sins. God will show more mercy on the judgment day to Tyre and Sidon than to you. Now, even with a very dynamic translation like what I just read, today's audiences still lack a lot of the information they need to understand the author's meaning. Here are some of the parts of the text that the audience has to fill out. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tyre and Sidon are towns. So, they have to know that. Judgment day is at the end of the world when God judges everyone. So, they have to fill that in. And then third, sackcloth is a kind of cloth worn to show mourning. Ashes also were a sign of mourning. Now, in this dynamic translation I just read, repentance is made explicit. But in another translation like the ESV, it wouldn't be made explicit. Now, here are some other contextual assumptions not in the text that the audience needs to supply. Chorazin and Bethsaida were inhabited by Jews. Tyre and Sidon were Gentile towns singled out repeatedly by Old Testament prophets for severe divine judgment because of their great sinfulness. The miracles were done by Jesus as part of his ministry in Chorazin and Bethsaida. Jesus had also called the people of Chorazin and Bethsaida to repentance. Mighty works were seen as divine authentications of spiritual ministry. You'd also need to know that the miracles Jesus did in Chorazin and Bethsaida authenticated his divine authority. And also, in spite of this, the Jews living in these towns had not followed Jesus' call to repentance. The people of Chorazin and Bethsaida thought that they were godly and more godly than the people of Tyre and Sidon. The people of Chorazin and Bethsaida thought Jews were more godly than Gentiles in general. The people of Chorazin and Bethsaida thought they would be approved by God on Judgment Day. And then also the people of Chorazin and Bethsaida thought the inhabitants of Tyre and Sidon would be punished severely on Judgment Day. You'd also need to know that the people of Chorazin and Bethsaida thought God would punish all Gentiles more harshly than Jews on Judgment Day. And finally, the people of Chorazin and Bethsaida thought that being approved by God depended on being Jewish. Since Jesus' miracles would have moved the notoriously sinful Gentiles of Tyre and Sidon to repentance, the Jews in Chorazin and Bethsaida are much worse off than those Gentiles and need to repent of their sins. (laughs) The relevance of this passage is due to the fact that Jesus eliminates or contradicts several of the assumptions of his audience. My main criterion for evaluating the helps provided in study Bibles is this. Does the information help the reader understand the passage? If the audience is able to access the intended context, they should be able to infer the intended implications. The context an audience needs depends on the kind of reader the study Bible has in view. However, 
The intended readership of study Bibles is usually stated as generally as possible so as not to put off possible readers. The introductions to study Bibles sometimes list other goals, and I also evaluate how they did according to those goals. The kind of study Bible helps I am looking for provide contextual assumptions that the audience does not already know, provide information that contributes to the intended interpretation, provide information that is true according to the best biblical scholarship, and bridge the new information to the audience's existing knowledge so they have a context in which to process the new information. So now that we have a good criteria for assessing study Bibles on this passage, let's look at the first one, the CEV Learning Bible. This Bible's goal is stated in its introduction. Here we go. Whether you began reading the Bible as a child or whether you are taking on this challenge now for the first time, the Learning Bible will help you get the most out of the time you set aside for this important educational and spiritual experience, end quote. It's designed for people with very limited Bible knowledge. So here's the text. You people of Chorazin are in for trouble. You people of Bethsaida are also in for trouble. If the miracles that took place in your towns had happened in Tyre and Sidon, the people there would have turned to God long ago. They would have dressed in sackcloth and put ashes on their heads. On the day of judgment, the people of Tyre and Sidon will get off easier than you will. Now here's the study note. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tyre, and Sidon. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum were Jewish towns on the northern end of Lake Galilee. Tyre and Sidon were important non-Jewish port cities on the Mediterranean seacoast. See the map on page 2375. While the people in these Jewish towns did not respond to Jesus' message and miracles, Jesus says that the people in cities like Tyre and Sidon would be more willing to turn to God, end quote. So here we have this Bible that does well in identifying Bethsaida and Chorazin as Jewish towns and Tyre and Sidon as non-Jewish cities, but it doesn't supply the contextual assumption that Tyre and Sidon were renowned for their wickedness. And it doesn't give us the information that Jews thought they would enter the kingdom of God based on their ethnicity. The details on geographic location reduce relevance by increasing processing costs without contributing to the intended implications. It doesn't really matter where they are on the map. So giving you a map page number is not really going to help you understand the intention of this passage. So when you make someone go look something up and then it produces no gain in cognitive effects and it clicking or making more sense, well, that just frustrates the reader. Now, restating what is clear in the text is not relevant, which is what it does at the end, right? So, it requires you processing, reading, with no increase in cognitive effects. Now, let's look at their second note that discusses the issue of sackcloth and ashes. It says, sackcloth is dark cloth, See Revelation 6.12, made of camel's hair or goat's hair. The Greek word for ashes in this verse refers to a kind of smoky soot. People wore sackcloth or put ashes on their head in times of deep sadness or when they wanted to show that they were sorry for their sins. See Esther 4.1, Job 2.8, end quote. Now, Dr. Hill says that knowing the color or origin of the cloth doesn't result in more cognitive effects, and so decreases the relevance of this passage. In the same vein, knowing the exact kind of ashes is not necessary to infer the intended meaning. The important thing is not the quality of the ashes, but the reason people put them on their heads, as explained in the last sentence of the note. Now, finally, they have a third note on the Day of Judgment. Here's what they say. This day was expected to be a time when God would judge the people of the world. Those who put their trust in Christ will be saved, but those who did not will experience God's anger and punishment. See Matthew 13, 47 through 50, 25, 31 through 46, John 12, 44 through 50. See also the mini article called Day of the Lord, page 1622. End quote. 
The first sentence in this note is relevant, but the note doesn't explain the Jewish view of what would happen to Jews and Gentiles on Judgment Day. Instead, it just provides good evangelistic teaching, which, while true, is not directly related to this passage. While the information on Judgment Day is partly provided in the mini-article mentioned, the effort required to access it is probably beyond the level most readers are willing to invest. The CEV Learning Bible notes on these verses send the reader to six other passages and two maps and a mini article. While this information is relevant for other goals, such as general knowledge of Bible times, it is not relevant to the understanding of these passages. Often, rather than being highly relevant, the reader struggles to find any logical link whatsoever. Having studied the text and the notes of the CEV Learning Bible, readers would still be missing some key contextual assumptions, and without these, they would miss many of the intended implications and other cognitive effects, and so would miss much of the relevance of the text for the first audience. Now, moving on to our next study Bible, we're going to look at the Catholic Study Bible, And it was designed, quote, to engage the reader, to read scriptures with new understanding and depth. The primary audience of the study Bible is Roman Catholic. However, the editors do not wish to exclude other Christian readers, end quote. So here's their translation text first. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, They would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. And on this passage, there is only one short note as follows. The call to repentance, that is a part of the proclamation of the kingdom, brings with it a severe judgment for those who hear it and reject it. End quote. The note of the Catholic Study Bible supplies an implication, but the reader may not be able to see how this follows from the text. In addition, while the implication given is true, it is not sufficient. If repentance was the only intended implication, the comparison with Tyre and Sidon would be unnecessary. The note does not guide the audience to understand that Jesus is challenging the Jews' notion of ethnic superiority and salvation based on their ethnicity. Despite the 577 pages of biblical background at the front of the Catholic Study Bible, readers would still be missing most of the intended contextual information for this passage. Now, moving on, what about the Harper Collins Study Bible? The introduction comments that the Bible comprises collections of books formed and written in cultures distant from our own, not only in time and space, but also in character. Indeed, what is required of us as readers is rather to enter through these texts into another world of meaning. Only when we have sensed the peculiarity and integrity of that other world can we build a bridge of understanding between it and our own. The introductions and notes accompanying the text in the HarperCollins Study Bible are designed to provide readers with the information that will make it easier to use this excellent translation, the NRSV, for the deeper kind of translation readers must make for themselves. The actual encounter with the multiple worlds of meaning that these texts can reveal. Okay, that sounds really good. So, although it's not stated explicitly, it seems that this Bible is addressed to Christians who who want an encounter with Scripture on a deeper level. So, does it actually deliver what it offers? So, here's our text. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But at the judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. So we have note number one. The exact location of Chorazin is unknown. Then Bethsaida. See note on 910. Tyre and Sidon, Phoenician, Parentheses Gentile, seacoast towns which Jesus did not visit. 
On the Need to Repent, see 338-1132-133-5-157-10-1630. and 10, 1630. Whew, not looking good. We've got note number two. Bethsaida had been recently built by Herod Philip on the Sea of Galilee. The notes of the Harper Collins Study Bible ask the reader to process a lot of information, but The only part that is relevant is that Tyre and Sidon were Gentile cities, and this is only given in parentheses. Irrelevant information includes the exact location of Corazon, the fact that Bethsaida had been recently built by Herod Philip, that it was on the Sea of Galilee, that Tyre and Sidon were Phoenician cities, that they are on the sea coast, and that Jesus did not visit them. One senses an archaeologist lurking behind the notes. That Jesus did not do miracles in Tyre and Sidon is clear in the text itself, and noting that he did not visit them is irrelevant. While repentance is a good thing, the cross-references given on repentance do not help the reader understand this passage better. So yeah, the HarperCollins Study Bible did not achieve its goal. Okay, so what about the NIV Study Bible? Surely this one will really deliver the goods. Now, the purpose of the NIV Study Bible is, quote-unquote, to communicate the Word of God to the hearts of people. Starting from the assumption that Scripture alone, with the Holy Spirit's guidance, is sufficient for believers, the introduction defends the need for a study Bible. Here's what it says. However, the Spirit also uses people to explain God's Word to others. It was the Spirit who led Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch's chariot. This interrelationship of the scriptures, so essential to understanding the complete biblical message, is a major theme of the study Bible notes. End quote. So, given this view, the authors of the NIV study Bible do their best to explain one scripture passage with other scripture passages rather than providing cultural information not found in the Bible itself. Hmm, let's see how this goes. Here's our text. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Okay, so here's the note. Chorazin, Bethsaida, See note on Matthew eleven twenty one, sackcloth and ashes. See Matthew eleven twenty one, Revelation eleven three, and notes. Okay, so we're gonna follow this rabbit trail that it sends us on. So we'll go to the note in Matthew eleven twenty one, Chorazin, mentioned in the Bible only twice here and in Luke ten thirteen. It was near the Sea of Galilee probably about two miles north of Capernaum. Bethsaida, on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee, Philip the Tetrarch built Bethsaida and named it Julius, after Julia, daughter of Caesar Augustus. Tyre and Sidon, cities on the Phoenician coast, north of the Holy Land. See note on Mark 7.31. Sackcloth, here a sign of repentance. See note on Genesis 37.34. See Revelation 6.12, ashes, also a sign of repentance. Okay, so let's keep following their rabbit trail to Genesis 37.34. We're going to see this note. Tore his clothes, put on sackcloth. Tearing one's clothes, see verse 29, and wearing coarse and uncomfortable sackcloth instead of ordinary clothes were both signs of mourning. See note on Revelation 11.3. Okay, so we're going to go and look at the note on Revelation 11.3. Two witnesses, modeled after Moses and Elijah. See notes on verses 5 through 6. They may symbolize testifying believers in the final period before Christ returns. Or they may be two actual individuals who will be martyred for the proclamation of the truth. And then I'm going to skip a little bit down to the bottom of the note where it's more relevant. Sackcloth. A coarse, dark cloth woven from the hair of goats or camels. It was worn as a sign of mourning and penitence. Joel 1.13, John 3, 5-6, through 6, 
Matthew eleven twenty one. With the goal of understanding Scripture with Scripture, readers enter a never-ending maze of cross-reference notes that cause even the highly biblical literate to forget what it was they were searching for. With each additional place the reader is directed to, processing costs increase without a commensurate increase in understanding of the passage in question. For example, the information in Genesis thirty-seven thirty-four shows that the practice of mourning in sackcloth and ashes existed in Jewish culture from the beginning. While this information might show the interrelatedness of Scripture, it does not contribute to the implications of this passage. Sending readers to Revelation eleven three is irrelevant on the same grounds, but it also requires the reader to sort through six lines of completely unrelated information before getting to the information on sackcloth. The note still misses the Jewish view of their superiority and grounds of salvation. Without knowing these things, it's not possible to understand the main point of the passage. Man, brutal. So, so Zondervan, if you're listening to this, we love your translation. We love the work that you do, but please, we think this could be better. Now, let's move on to a very different flavor of study Bible. It's the NET Bible, N-E-T Bible, and it boasts 60,932 translators' notes and claims that it offers, quote, a vast and growing library of trustworthy content all integrated into an easy-to-use online environment. This puts high-quality Bible study tools and resources within the reach of the whole world without charge a price all pastors, missionaries, Bible teachers, and individuals can afford, which I am very thankful for and applaud, by the way. They go on, the most comprehensive set of free resources available online, including commentaries, articles, word studies, original biblical languages, and cross-references, all integrated into a system that empowers you to carefully study the Word of God and to prepare your teaching lessons quickly, end quote. So, the Net Bible claims a wide audience. Now, first on the list are pastors, of course, people with a high degree of motivation and Bible knowledge, including knowledge of the biblical languages, we hope. But the authors also felt it would be useful for personal devotional reading, for study, and for lesson preparation. Does it accomplish its goals? Let's check it out. Reading the translation first, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. Here's our first note. Chorazin was a town of Galilee that was probably fairly small in contrast to Bethsaida and is otherwise unattested. Bethsaida was declared a polis by the Tetrarch Herod Philip sometime after A.D. 30. Oh, this is just cringe. So, the Net Bible, once again, leads the reader to a geography and history lesson, neither of which contributes to the implications of the passage. It's got another note on the word if. This introduces a second class, contrary to fact, condition in the Greek text. (laughs) Uh, No comment. Note three on miracles or, quote-unquote, powerful deeds, okay? Note four on the word tire. Map for location, C map 1A2, map 2-G2, map 4A1, JP3, F3, JP4, F3. Oh, boy. And finally, the last note says, Tyre and Sidon are two other notorious Old Testament cities, Isaiah 23, Jeremiah 25, 22, 47, 4. The remark is a severe rebuke. In effect, quote, even the sinners of the old era would have responded to the proclamation of the kingdom unlike you, end quote. And then comment on Sidon, map for location, see map 1A1, JP3, F3, JP4, F3. So, Well, note five communicates the fact that Tyre and Sidon are notorious cities, but readers would need to read the Isaiah and Jeremiah passages, a considerable processing cost, 
to learn what these cities were notorious for. The note hints that their notoriety lay in being sinners, but this is subtle and does not communicate the extreme wickedness of these people. Once again, after processing all of these notes, readers would still be missing the vast majority of the contextual assumptions they would need to understand the passage. Now, what about the NLT? The NLT Life Application Bible. Let's check this out. Here's what the introduction says. It starts out by asking, have you ever opened your Bible and asked the following, what does this passage really mean? How does it apply to my life? Why does some of the Bible seem irrelevant? What do these ancient cultures have to do with today? I love God. Why can't I understand what he's saying to me through his word? What's going on in the lives of these Bible people? Many Christians do not read the Bible regularly. Why? Because in the pressures of daily living, they cannot find a connection between the timeless principles of Scripture and the ever-present problems of day-by-day living. This is why the Life Application Study Bible was developed, to show how to put into practice what we have learned. End quote. So, will it live up to its ideals with this passage? Let's listen to their translation first. What horrors await you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have sat in deep repentance long ago, clothed in sackcloth and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Yes, Tyre and Sidon, will be better off on the judgment day than you. I really like that translation, by the way. It really comes across well. It reads nicely. It really communicates a lot of that implicit information that somebody would need. Okay, what's their note? Chorazin was a city near the Sea of Galilee, probably about two miles north of Capernaum. Tyre and Sidon were cities destroyed by God as punishment for their wickedness. Ezekiel 26 through 28. End quote. Well, once again, we get a geography lesson, but doesn't really help us understand the passage. While recognizing that Tyre and Sidon were wicked cities, this note does not include the key information that they were Gentile cities. And unfortunately, the information given about them is not true. Although there were prophecies of their destruction, and Alexander conquered them in 332 BC, he did not completely destroy them. Nor is there other evidence that they were ever completely destroyed. In fact, in Jesus' day, they were prosperous cities. Inaccurate information may result in cognitive effects, but not the intended ones. Notes need to be both relevant and true. So, sadly, the NLT Life Application Bible would not help readers find the connection between these verses and their daily life and put into practice what they have learned. In fact, the notes do not even guide readers to the intended implications. Ouch. So, why are we talking about this on a Bible translation podcast? This is a study Bible. This is for English speakers. Well, here's the thing. When you are providing the Bible to a minority people group in another language, a study Bible or any kind of study notes that you can add, maybe later after it's published or whatever, will be pure gold to most people because they have so little resources. They don't have all these amazing commentaries. They don't have all these amazing sermons that they can listen to day in and day out and podcasts that give you all of this kind of background information on the text and help you build your cognitive environment so that you can really make a connection in a deeper, more meaningful way with the text of the Bible. And so, we, we need good models, first of all, for how to do study Bibles for these other language groups. And we need to know what kind of notes we would want to even translate in the first place. So, now the big question still stands at this point. You're probably all waiting. What would a truly relevant note actually say for this passage? And we're in luck because Dr. Hill provides a model of what she believes would be a very helpful note. Turning to the translation project I'm most familiar with, many Ajukru 
already have both an interest in and basic knowledge of the Bible since the community converted en masse to Christianity in 1915. They would already be aware of the fact that miracles were signs of divine authentication and that Bethsaida and Corazon were towns. The translation already makes clear that sackcloth and ashes were a sign of repentance. So, a relevant note might say, the people of Corazon and Bethsaida thought that on Judgment Day, God would accept them because they were Jews, and that God would condemn all non-Jews. Jesus challenges these ideas by comparing them with the people of Tyre and Sidon, two non-Jewish cities who were renowned for their wickedness. God does not accept people because of their ethnicity, but because they repent of their sins. When checking notes in the Ajukru translation of the New Testament, one respondent said, Oh, madame, this note is very helpful. It's just the contents that needs to be changed. This evaluation leads me to say the same of the English study Bible surveyed in this paper. The concept of a study Bible is very helpful, but the contents need to be changed. We now have conceptual tools to do better. That's all for this episode. Thanks for joining me and a big thank you to Dr. Harriet Hill for making this presentation possible. Her hard work and her research is really amazing. Definitely check out the actual article this is based on. It's linked in the description and there's a lot more detail in it, including some other study Bibles that we didn't talk about in this episode. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible and go deeper into it and become like the man of Psalm 1.